Hello, I'm Mike Buchanan, leader of the political party Justice for Men and Boys and the Women Who Love Them. I'm joined today by James Mackey, a successful businessman who has made it his mission in life to help people whenever he can, as a life coach and otherwise. He wrote a book, he wrote and published a book titled, It Does Happen to Men. The book is the real story of how he survived many years where he was subjected to domestic abuse, emotional abuse, verbal abuse, and more, which often escalated into physical abuse and violence during a 20 year marriage. The book centers around the diary that James kept for over a year, recording a multitude of incidents, thoughts, and feelings. The book explains how the cycle of abuse developed. The diary section is followed by James's account of the four year period in which he tried to make sense of his nightmare, which he eventually did before escaping it. James, a very warm welcome. Thank you. Nice to, nice to talk to you tonight. Nice to talk Likewise. to everybody out there. James, the first of my questions is perhaps uh, the obvious one in, in, in these sorts of scenarios. What motivated you to write your story? Well, it, it, was, it was the fact that, first of all, when I was in the situation, the, there was very little help available for men. That's the first thing that I encountered. Wherever I turned, there was, um, you know, there was there was lots and lots of support and things for for women, and and not a lot for men. And it, and it was it was some of the some of the reactions I had when I tried to talk to people about it was kind of like disbelief. And I thought it was really really important that I I put the story out there um, to help other guys open up and, and tell their story because I did know that you know the tight in the title it does happen to men is just wanted to put it out there that it does happen to men because so many people were saying it doesn't it always it's always women and um you know I just had this this after I'd come out of the relationship after I'd gone through an initial period of healing um it was about giving something back about helping others and I thought if I wrote the story and I was able to help one guy that would be the, that make the difference that make it worthwhile but also i think in writing it i need to get it off my chest mm. and what i did find that find it was very cathartic to, to to write it and to put it all down in paper uh, and read it and 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 as i was doing it i was i was kind of reliving it but i was also closing the door mm. to what had happened and for me it was a, it was a bit of a process there it's, it's an interesting that you use the word catharsis james it's one that's used by um, all the men I know who've written books or just personal accounts or made videos that, you know, you kind of slay, it's probably not a very apt dis description, but you, you're kind of slaying demons in a sense, aren't you? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You're putting things to, to rest and you're, you're, you're basically facing because, because the temptation is that when you've gone through a trauma, whether it be this or something else is you, you shut it in the back of your mind and you, you try to push it away and forget about it. But actually that, that, that can lead to, you know, a depression that can lead to, you know, holding it, your feelings internal. Uh, and generally as men are not good at expressing them. And, you know, if I wasn't able to talk and tell everybody it face to face, maybe, by writing it down in paper and doing it that way, it was another way of doing it. And so I was able to just do it and and, it, and see, try to make sense of it because when you're in when you're in a, an abusive relationship um, with someone who's maybe narcissistic, not NPD, narcissistic personality disorder, or I believe my ex-wife was um, uh, a borderline personality disorder, and there's some very similar traits, is that um, they, they they make you think that you're the problem. They make you think that everything is wrong with you. Um, they project things onto you. And so I would, I, 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 at times you would believe that kind of thing. So actually living it and going through step by step what happened and, and just going by, well, how didn't I notice it? That's by doing that, I was able to say, well, of course I didn't notice it. It was so subtle at first and it built over years and years until suddenly I was trapped. Uh, and one day I woke up, uh, you know, I kind of saw myself and I realized I don't have any friends or any people who have disappeared, what's happened. And the, the light became to shine and, and dawn on me what was going on. You, your your ex-wife, you're, you're now very happily married a second time round. Yes. I'm, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased, pleased to learn. 
Um, but your, your, your ex suffered um, really, to my mind, at least I'm no expert in these areas, but so, it seemed to me from the book pretty severely from OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. I wonder if you could say a few words and, and illustrate that. Yeah, so, um, I mean, the thing with o OCD, it's an illness and, you know, it does require treatment. But and, and I think uh, with the research I've done, it, it actually goes hand in hand that people with a personality disorder can have other disorders and, and they kind of mesh together and they, they, they blur at times. So, I mean, her, her OCD centered around um, and it's in the book and, you, you know, it's all in there, but we when she had her first child, she had bad morning sickness and then she wanted, but, but got through it. OK. And then she got pregnant with a, which would, would have been our second child and got really, really sick. Um, and she was di diagnosed with hyperemis gravidarum, which is, which is, you know, pretty bad. And I would never just, you know, just, you know, you know, dispel what, what that must be like for a woman to go through that, through the, the pregnancy. But it made her very, very sick and she felt she couldn't go on with the pregnancy. And in that point, she um, decided that she was going to have an abortion, which I, I was totally against. You know, we, we really wanted this second child. And, um, you know, we, we were it, it was it was about 14 or 15 weeks in that she got to. And it was really difficult. And so that 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 whole thing was, was a difficult period. So that's when she started changing. But then after that she got quite obsessive about having another baby and doing the research about she was always right from can, the start can I just I, yeah. i'm sorry james but there was a there was um a, a little bit of an account that um that, that that i thought was very interesting here that 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 you took her to the abortion clinic and yeah. you saw a church nearby yeah went, so went, went in sorry so if you want to take up the story from there yes yeah, so, okay so the, the, so we went she, she i mean this is the kind of thing she made me drive her to the abortion clinic even though i was against it and 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 i couldn't say no i couldn't not take her i wasn't going to let her do good do it on her own and so yeah i was made to take her so she, she i dropped her off outside uh, and she went in and right across the, the like a little park area there was a church and i'd, I'd not wasn't really going to church much at that time i, I mean i had on and off and you fairly you know i had, had faith but i wasn't really a big church girl but i went into that church and i really i just prayed that that she wouldn't go through with it um and i prayed and prayed and then i came out and sat in the car and you know and, and i was really quite quite um upset about the whole thing and actually she did she came out and said she couldn't go through with it you know and so for me there was a there was you know a, a definite spiritual moment there that that my, my prayer was answered and so she went another, I think, week or 10 days and then just couldn't take it anymore and went back. And the second time she went, you know, I don't think I prayed that time, but she, she did go through with it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, a, I think she went on her own, you said, the second time. No, I, I did take oh. her down, but she, she went in on her own and, you know, we didn't speak. And I, I just remember driving back, the, I think it was two hours drive or more than that back and a two or three hours drive and, and we didn't hardly spoke hardly said a word i think we, i don't think we did speak yeah. and i i couldn't i couldn't face her um i couldn't speak to her and that night i remember a pile of iron and just upstairs sorry, John, ironing you, away yeah. crying you know so. you, you you have a line um in your book uh, i think that was the day our marriage died yes and how how, yeah. how far into the 20 year marriage was this james so i'm just thinking it must have been I'm trying to think now about 14 years. Wow. wow. Yeah, but yeah, 12 okay. or 14 years. Okay. J J James, um, you often hear people say to people who are in abusive relationships that they should just leave. Yeah. I, I wonder how you would respond to people who, 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 uh, who say that. Yeah, I think, I mean, it gets said to women, it says to, you know, to men, anyone in, in this kind of abusive or toxic relationship, people say, well, just leave, just leave. But the, the thing with that is, that as I, I said, I touched on earlier, is that when when you're in a relationship with someone who has a, a personality disorder or that type of type of person, they are they control you. They control your life. They have built it over time so that you you know you could you know it could be that you're financially dependent on them, or are you so intertwined that you, you don't have the availability of cash to to leave? Um, they they spend the whole time telling you that everything's your fault. 
Um, my ex-wife would say to me that I was I was rubbish. I was nothing that no one would ever want me. And if I ever left, she would, you know, have everything. I would end up with nothing. I'd live in a dirty, grotty old flat on my own and be really lonely. You know, so lo and behold, that wasn't what happened. But you, you actually are in that situation. You don't know what's true and what's not. And you get sucked into that and you develop a, a codependency. There's a there's a codependency on that person and looking to that person for approval all the time and trying to keep on their good side and and doing these kind of things. And, and you're really so intertwined to break that. You've got to be really in a, in a strong place mentally mm -hmm. um, and supported and if you don't have that network, it really isn't easy to leave. So whether, you know, you need finances, you need a plan, you know, it's easy to do a plan. And, you know, when I've tried to leave several times, I had a plan, but, you know, something would get in the way. She would, she would be able to, to drag me back in somehow or another. One time, you know, she told me that her mum had cancer and I just, you know, couldn't go through with it. And uh, another time, I, I, yeah. I know at one point she had, she had the family come around to persuade. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that that was the that was after after going to court. It was after going to court. So I I did look for support and I did find some support from a site, um, a site called um, Shrink for Men, and it deals mainly with um, uh, uh, women guys who are in a abusive relationship with um, um, borderline personality disorder. It kind of deals with that. And the Dr. Um, Tara Pamante oh, yeah. is um, yeah, yeah. And there as well. Really, really good. And there's a forum on there to talk. But all the advice I had with everyone was go go down the legal route. You know, you need to you need to take things, make your plan, get a lawyer, go and do that. You know, go and speak to your GP, go and speak to your lawyer, go and speak to this and, and get that in place. So uh, so that's what I did. I, I remember, remember though, going to speak to my GP to tell him that I, I was being abused and he wasn't interested in me at all but just because I mentioned I had children he only was focused on the children I was never interested in them and the next thing I know I had calls from from the social services and things like that as well so um and I did I, so I got a lawyer and they advised me to go for um uh, anti-molestation order they advised me to go for um I can't remember the names now, the custody, um, go for the custody for the children and go for um, the, the, the home as well to, to obviously to, to protect the children. And I went to court and I had, I had the, the, the basis of this book. So without emotion was the, the, the diary part of my book. So a year of events. And in that year of events, you have 18 cases of abuse or violence to, you know, where a child has been hit or slapped to my children and 36 against me in the place of a year and uh, and the judge said it wasn't enough oh my god the judge said there wasn't enough evidence there there wasn't enough there there That's and he ridiculous. wasn't he wasn't willing to grant me any of the orders apart from one to protect the children just in case um until he'd had her her side of the story That's now, not you, you, uh, um, uh, you may or may not know uh, james that there's a book called Say Goodbye to Crazy by Dr. Tara Palmatier and Paul Elam, which I'm, I'm told mm -hmm. is very good. Yeah. That, 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 that is, I believe, about a BPD women. Yeah, yeah, no, it is a really good book. Um, and that's where I, I, I kind of, through that support from that website, I kind of found out about her as well. So, and what I was dealing with, and I knew that she wouldn't change. But I went to the court, and I think if I would, if I'd have been a woman going to the court with that yeah. amount of evidence, oh my God, yes. yeah. that amount of evidence, there is no shadow of a doubt the court orders would have been granted, you know, the man would have been thrown out, take it, told not to go back to the house, to find somewhere else and not to, to go out there until we went to court on the Tuesday. He, he actually told me, yeah, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to go back to that home and I, you need to stay there because of what you say is true. You need to be there to, you know, for the children, but I'm putting you back in that situation, you know, and, and he was really clear about that. And I just, I just couldn't believe it. You, you wonder how much violence would have been enough for him. I suspect no amounts. I mean, uh, unless no. unless there was, you know, it was really coming close to some p potentially lethal situation. Yeah, I mean, this is ten was, years ago. Yeah. yeah, this is ten yeah. years ago, and I would, and and it it was uh, in England, and I'm I'm hoping the the legal system will have would have moved on since then, and it's not the same for, for guys. I, but uh, I'm supporting I someone. I very, I very yeah. much doubt that the direction of travel is always a bad one. Yeah. James. James, that that brings me nicely to 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 the to uh, the next question. Um. We, we, we spoke just before this interview um, 
uh, about a couple of short pages which quite struck me. Um, I wonder if you could just read those out and then I'll ask the question. Yeah. So yeah, it's on page 121 of my book. Um, she then spent a whole hour shouting and arguing with me before sulking back into her room and calling her mother. She said she wanted a divorce. She said that because she was the woman and the mother, that she would keep the house and everything else, and therefore I'd end up with nothing and would have to pay for all that she had. Basically, this is a threat to blackmail me into just accepting her rubbish. She has used this threat many times, but I'm ready to call her bluff. Now, the reason that, the reason that struck me, James, is that that's sort of something that every woman in that situation knows, but very often doesn't say. Mm. Um, so it's like it's like they, they they have this weapon. You know, they 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 may or may not reveal that they have the weapon. They may or may not use it, but it's it's always there. Mm. Yeah. No, I definitely think it's the case. And she used it several times. She would. Uh, another example similar to that is um, it was it was quite common for her to be in my face, shouting and screaming at me. You know, almost spit coming on me as she's she's uh, you know verbally abusing me and calling me all the names, calling my mother names, calling my brother, calling you know, come family. You know, even our, our friends. She would be she would be like it was just a tirade of, of abuse. And then in that she'd be right in my face poking me you know pushing me expecting me to react um and you know if i kind of like want you know if i kind of like or there may have been a time she's she's slapping me and i kind of like stayed myself as if i might have wanted to to retaliate she was like go on then go on then i'll just call the police and you'll be arrested and you'll be taken away you know and that'll be it and that's the threat that she used so very very different ones it's sometimes subtle sometimes very blatant like that uh, yeah, something that Bill, Bill, Bill Burr, <laughs> Bill Burr, memorably, you know, the, the American comedian, I don't know if you know him, but uh, he's, he's one of my heroes, c c comedy heroes. And, and, and he, he talks about domestic violence a lot. And he, so he talks about a situation where, you know, a man hits a woman and no one is interested in the backstory. No. It's, it's like, you know, the, you know, the, the, it doesn't matter. I mean, women know how to provoke men or some men into violence. Um, yeah. And he said, you know, if I if I turned up um, at a friend's house and I had my arm in a sling, and they said, what, what happened, Bill? And I said, oh, I got bitten by a rattlesnake. They would want to know the backstory. They'd, they'd say, Bill, how did that how did that happen? Wait, were you were you fucking with it? What what what, 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 what? but somehow when it when it comes to a man strikes a woman, the backstory is 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 absolutely relevant. Yeah, yeah the perfect. And as you say, you know, she invited you to strike her for yeah. for, for her personal gain. Um, James, can I ask? Sorry, first of all, um, did you, I know you had a daughter? Were there more children from your first marriage? There were two two daughters. Yeah. Two daughters. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, did your did did your wife? I mean, through all these years, ever ever seek help with her mental health issues? And uh, no, no, she didn't. And um, the reason being is that she she was a, a professional in a professional job with a degree and you know qualifications, and she thought she was superior to to anyone, and that that she could she could diagnose or sort of self if she wanted to, and uh, that they just talk rubbish. Um, and in fact, there was at one point we did go to relate. Uh, oh, as a, as a man, yeah Good so luck with that. yeah so we, we went to relate for counseling and um this was after i'd had an affair oh. so so we, we talk about and it's something i'm not proud of but I, I did it and you know so we'd gone i think about four years at that point three or three years or four years without sex sex between us and she was always refusing it using it as a stick and a carrot dangling it and pulling it away and just just doing it and so there was sexual control there and then one day, I think I, she, I, I tried, I was, you know, I tried to, 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 you know, have sex with her, and she was like, "Just get away, go and find it elsewhere." So I thought I will. So I did, and I found it elsewhere. I went online and and found it elsewhere, and um, you know, it's not something I'm proud of, but I think, you know, I was a man. It's really and, understandable after yeah, three years. I think, James. I think people would understand it. Mm. But so I, I did that, and um, I tried to leave. And um, uh, that night, me and this one, we, we, we actually formed a good relationship, decided we were going to leave our respective partners and we we're going to set up together. And I went home back to the house. I already had stuff packed, had my emergency bag packed and stuff, got it, put it in the car and she literally laid on the bonnet saying, you're not leaving. And, you know, we, we, we went back in and 
she she told she, the first thing she did is brought the kids and said to them your dad's been having an affair with a tart off the internet and stuff like that and told them your dad's dad's done all this and your dad's done all that so so we went to relate and um we're talking there we went for the first session and you know she's like you know why are you here well you need to tell him that he's wrong and what he's done is wrong and all that as well but of course she wanted to know the backstory like you said so she wanted to know well how did you get to this point and she was very you know balanced about it and because um because because my ex wasn't getting the answers and and all the things that to validation that she uh, she was imperfect and i was doing everything i did was wrong you know even though i was quite happy to admit what i did was wrong it, she wouldn't do it anymore so no other point would she ever go for help and even to this day she's never got help for it and it's just got worse so because i guess people indulge it don't they in, yeah. you know in, in in a way that they probably you know a wife probably wouldn't indulge her husband i suspect no and the thing is what what and 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 the children because one of the, one of my biggest regrets is i wasn't able to leave with the children and they were a lot older at that point in time so they were a bit, a bit, a bit more savvy. But how, how old would that have been, James? Um, I think nine and nine and fifteen, sixteen. Yeah. Okay. So nine and fifteen. So they were, they were a lot older, and they were able to understand, especially the older one, what was going on, and um, it, it just the, the problem was that we spent our lives lying, as in, if you were asked a question, did you put that there? you had to answer the right answer that would not provoke her into a rage or if you know, or did you step on that or did you clean that? It's like, you know, the yes or the no was even if you did or you didn't. And we actually used to enjoy not following her, her massive list of rules when she wasn't about in the house. So maybe on a Saturday, she'd be wo working. We'd walk around with our shoes on, we were outdoor clothes because there, there was so many rules. You couldn't make them up. Um, you know, like you, you had to take, you had to immediately change all your clothes when you came in from outside. You had to take your shoes off on the mat. You know, if you'd been out anywhere, you had to have a shower, uh, you know, tin the beans from, or, you know, carton of milk that's been delivered or you've bought at the supermarket has to be wiped to a antibacterial wipes before it comes in. Uh, and this was all in a, in a sort of way of stopping her feeling or becoming sick like she did in the original pregnancy. So and, uh, just just quickly, I, I, I believe one of your daughters um, was alienated, you know, so suffered parental alienation. So, yeah. So um, the youngest one I have a great relationship with and, okay. you know, we, we anytime I can get I live I'm 400 miles away now. But, you know, anytime I'm in the area and, and holidays and things like that, you know, we spend time together. We do things together. We have a great time outdoors and we just do lots, lots of things. And and, you know, and and, you know, we, we message all the time and, you know, and that communication is there direct. Um, but the eldest one um, after I left and, and it wasn't as I was leaving, I, she understood why I was leaving. She understood that I needed to get away. But when I met my, my new wife, which was quite shortly afterwards, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a long time. Uh, and that, that really helped me. My, my ex-wife didn't like the fact mm. I had a new relationship. So every time, you know, it didn't matter what, after I'd split the whole thing, I was a liar. I just lied, everything, you know, I, I just did things to suit myself. I was selfish. All these kind of things was being fed into her. And she she said, I, I hear from the younger, younger one that, you know, it's not it's not me, it's that she doesn't like my ex, my, my new wife, but actually it's the whole poison that against the whole situation. So she won't speak to me at all because I've got a new wife. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't ring true. It's been alienation all the way through. And there was a couple of times, the last so they call it going grey rock. So I go, go grey rock with, with my ex. I only communicate to her on email where there is a trail and about my, my, my youngest child so that, so that you know, when I'm visiting and things like that, that's the only time I communicate. And maybe some things about school reports and stuff like that as well. But I, the school sends me them direct. So I do, I do get them. I don't need to engage with her. Um, but the reason for that is the last time I was there, um and face to face i had to go to the door for for some reason i can't remember what it was but she was so vicious and abusive about my my new wife um we weren't married at that point and um in fact that she 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 refused to to sign off the decree absolute 
when we were getting divorced. So it meant that our, our wedding was, was kind of really messed up that we'd planned. So, but in the end, I was able to take her to court and, and get that, get that um, granted, which was right. like a, get that granted direct. So I applied for it. Good. So. good. And you've now got a very beautiful wife. I can, I can tell there. I, 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 I do. I, I, yes. I do. Um, very do, James, do you think there are any differences in the domestic abuse experienced by men and women? Well, the, the the only the only slight difference there could be is that that is perhaps some the, the physical violence subjected potentially or the power that a man has against a woman can be more so so when it comes to the violent aspect of of abuse then then a woman you know generally the man is stronger and could inflict more damage in that point but actually the the, the psychological abuse the verbal abuse, the, the emotional abuse, the control, all those kind of things from, and I've had this, and the reason I can, I can say this is that a lot of women have read my book, a lot of women who've been through abuse or support people with abuse, and they find it very empowering because the, the story and what's happened to me, they recognize it, it's exactly the same. So, so give, you know, apart from that, so I was subjected to to, to physical I was I was punched I was kicked I was slapped you know so and it hurt I was ridiculed I was belittled I was controlled I couldn't go anywhere without permission you know and all these kind of things it's, it's exactly the same I had there was um maybe the sexual abuse was slightly it was more abstinent in my case I was more abstinence than 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 rape or, or you know or forcing it herself on me but I do know men who have been in the situation who they're ex or their wife their partner at that time actually did force them to have sex with them some of them were promiscuous as well so i think it's very, you can't i don't think there's any gender bias between the you know under domestic abuse it's it's the person and the personality that causes it and if you think back you know how many times have you known somebody to be under the thumb Oh, look at him! Look at your my uncle or your dad or your granddad or someone you might have known were described as being under the thumb or 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 she wears the trousers in the house, you know, and it's a joke, you know. But actually, probably if you were to dig behind it, that person's probably suffering a lot more than just that. And my my ex father in law is a prime example of you know his you know it, it tends to go in generations of the you know her mother was definitely narcissistic, you know, and the way that the father was treated over a long time was was pretty bad pretty bad and he just was a recluse he just spent most of the time on his own and in the end he died of a stroke probably from stress because yeah. of it so i'd just like to go back to the point you make about men generally being stronger than their partners which, which is yeah. of course true but if, if they don't use that strength then you know what, yeah. what does it matter and um i, I know we, we spoke about the other day some um, some research that People, a lot of the attendees at this conference will, will know about, but it's a very interesting, I think it's the largest ever study of its kind, the Partner Abuse State of Knowledge Project 2013 or okay. PASC. Yeah, yeah. And in very rough terms, um, in about 60% of, this is heterosexual couples now, yeah. where there's um, domestic violence, um, it's, it's two ways. Sometimes one partner will start it, sometimes the other. But in the 40% of, of uh, couples where there's uh, domestic, again, straight couples where there's domestic violence, the perpetrator is slightly more than twice as likely to be the woman as the man. Mm. And yet we get this bullshit narrative all the time in the mainstream media that the overwhelming majority of victims are women and the overwhelming majority of, of, uh, of perpetrators are men. And there's always, you know, there's always online or in, in papers, magazines, there's always a photograph of a cowering woman with a man yeah. with a clenched fist or a, a bat or something. Yeah. It's, it's just, um, you know, it's been known to be a lie for 50 years. But anyway, um, okay. And, and so just moving on to, we have, we have a couple of questions left. Um, James, I wonder if you could take us through your experience with the legal system and why you think it let you down. Um, well, yeah, we touched on this earlier, didn't we? So, I mean, obviously I... I I went down the legal system and I went there and, and, you know, with all the preparation I had and the legal advice I had um, to go for the orders, I expected to be supported. And, and that was, that was such a, a difficult thing to do. That was so hard. I, I didn't have, I, I couldn't, there was no one with me apart from a lawyer. I didn't have any support because I, I couldn't talk to people about it. Um, and, and 
I virtually felt I was laughed at. You know, do, do you think it, it's it's rather odd or suspicious that a lawyer would have given you advice that turned, you know, that turned out to just not reflect the real world? I mean, was was he or she surprised at the judge's response? They were, but what I did find out is that the, the person I'd be working closest with was actually a trainee and wasn't a full lawyer, so there may have been some some you know misguidance in there at all. But I think actually that the, the the interesting thing was that the there were I was referred to these lawyers by a, a women's domestic abuse charity who did look after some women and they used them often. So I think that they just followed the same approach they would have done for a woman. Yes, they didn't yes. treat me any different. No. And so that that's I think that's the shock there is because the domestic abuse, they believed me, they understood my story, they looked at the evidence and they went through the same process and advised me in the same way as they would have advised a woman, except that the judge didn't see a woman, did he? You know, I've actually even thought about rewriting my book as a man, as a woman, just the exact same words, just turning it around and seeing what the reaction gets. I bet, I bet, I bet some of the, the women's organizations would love the book, you know, and then I'd reveal yes. eventually down the road that it was written by a man and they'll yes. see the difference because I think they, they would be appalled that a woman would, I mean, and, and some would go to court with false evidence and, and get thrown out, but you know, why would I write a diary with times and dates and specifics into that detail, that much detail, you know, it, it just doesn't make sense. And, you know, th the fact that they sent me back to the home, that's when um, my ex brought her family down. So I, I had to wait till the, it would be the Tuesday. So this was a, the Friday night and I had to, they, she was served her papers on the Friday night and then I had to wait for her to be served the papers and then you know, see what happened. And I thought she was going to go crazy. She actually didn't. She just couldn't believe it. She was actually so couldn't believe that I'd actually done that. I think it was a shock. But I, she called her mom and a mom and a brother and a sister, and they all came down. And they just, I didn't sleep for about three nights because they were there wearing me down. Mm. They, they just wore me down until I said, "Look, I'll, 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 I'll retract it all." So but the, I went. But, to, I mean, yeah, but I mean, there are so many lawyers. I mean, mainly family lawyers, mainly women. Who, who know perfectly well what what um what, what what the silver bullets are yeah so so false accusations or even saying you feel fearful well it could be that your behavior towards your your male partner has been so so appalling that that it's not surprising you feel, feel fearful but, but but i mean basically women women are, are are instructed to make false allegations and then and then they win they yeah. they, they get all that yeah. they want um it's 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 um it's a truly appalling thing um, James, um, where did you find support as a victim of, as a male victim of domestic abuse? Um, and do you think there's enough support for men in similar situations? So the, the support I had initially was from Shrink for Men, like I mentioned earlier, yeah. and that was about the only website I could really find. I did, um, and this, this is obviously 10 years ago, I did reach out to Mankind, mm. but they didn't. The, the, the uh, sorry the, the mankind initiative yeah the mankind yeah the, there's a website called mankind yeah. and they just didn't seem to have any resources or anything to be able to support me they just it was just i think i didn't really get a response you know it was just it wasn't really really any right. good so but, but, um, but, you, but, you, but you say some um some, some kind things about them in your book that, that you spoke to a lady who was very you know she she listened and she she but 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 you didn't feel that they did much beyond that. There wasn't much they could do. Yeah, they, they did just sort of listen and that, and it it was a it, that was a, a little bit disappointing. I, I know that I, I know people involved in the organisation now, and I know they have a bit more funding and things are moved in a lot better way. Um, and in Scotland uh, as well, there's something called Amis uh, Abuse Men in Scotland, which yes. is helping someone that I'm supporting as well at the moment. A guy who's gone gone through um, a very similar situation to me. Um, and being accused, he's actually been accused of stuff. Um, he's had, she's had support from the women's organisation, which I, I won't name, but they've basically counter accused him of everything, which uh, is quite common. Um, I mean, for me, yeah, it's just, um, it's just quite, quite hard. I've forgotten what the question is now. <laughs> and no, it was about about the support for men. Um, of course, I mean, the yeah. Mankind Initiative, you know, run, is, is run on a shoestring compared yeah. to the millions that Women's Aid and Refuge and other organizations get. And in fact, there's, there's, a, there's a, I think it's a men's advice line, um, which I'm told reliably by, by some people. 
when men call it the the underlying assumption is that he's probably a perpetrator yes presenting as a victim so it's, it's yeah. all it's all I think, up, it's, it's up there with the Duluth model which is just um an yeah. absolute you know pile of lies yeah and the, the, I think the the UK helpline that you get the national one is actually run by I think women's aid or something like that that's, and, that's, and, I, I, and yes yeah I yeah. think it's called respect I, I could yeah, be wrong but yeah uh, but it's it's run by a women's organisation and really they don't do a lot lot to support and it, it, there isn't enough funding. I mean, I, I work. Um, I know you've you've got gender parity. Um, uh, also mm. been a part of the the conference and um, Phil Tanzer as well, good friend of mine. Yes. And we've worked together on, on stuff. And you know, there is a a minister for you know for you know for women. There is no minister for men. There is a if you look at the the domestic violence, it's all about um, you know abuse and, and violence against women and girls. There's, there's no mention of boys. No, you know even today on the radio, I'm hearing you know a local council um, you know on the radio talking about an advice line for for violence against women and girls. There's no mention. Why aren't they saying violence against people? You know, because everywhere else we have to be gender neutral. We have to balance well, they, it out. I mean, the radical feminists, of course, captured the well, captured the narrative 50 years ago from Erin Pitsy and turned it into a very profitable industry. I, w I wonder if we could uh, perhaps finish off with, um, with with you saying a few words um, about the Scottish Family Party, James. Yeah, um, Scottish Family Party is. Um, well, it's it's got a Christian foundation, but it's not a Christian party, and that, that's quite clear because we are it's, it is open to all sorts of so, sorts of people. It doesn't matter to domination. We're 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 not pro. Or we're we're uh, we're completely on the fence when it comes to the independence, which is probably the biggest thing in politics in Scotland. You know, people vote for a party purely on either the for or against independence. And, and we've deliberately said, no, we're, we're you know, we, we don't think it's right to, to have a vote at this point because we had one. But apart from that, we don't don't really get into that. Our, our main um, policies are around family, family values. It's called a family party. And, and there's a lot of policies there to try and strengthen the family because, um, I mean, I believe that the family is a fundamental building block of society, mm. you know, and if you're a Christian, you can know it's the Bible, the building block is a man and a woman and the family. And, and you know, and that's how that's how we, we progress. And if we don't have children, if we don't grow the families, the population declines. So we've been propping up the population with, with immigration, which is fine, but it's not the only way. And, and there's a discouragement to, to have families as there's a, a push to, to, to everyone to go out and women and men to go out to work and put your children into childcare and the cost prohibit, prohibitiveness of things like that means that people have less children. And so we, we, we want to encourage families. Um, we're also the only pro, uh, oh, uh, well, pro-life party mm. in, in Scotland uh, and probably in, in UK that's one of the only ones that's really pushing out the, on the pro-life message, which um, obviously will alienate quite a big chunk of the population. Um, a lot of people, you know, just don't even get it, um, especially, you know, the, the pro-choice, a lot of the arguments saying, well, you know, if you, we, we're quite realistic, you know, the ideal would be great to ban abortion, but we realise that going from abortion level there to right down to zero, we're probably going to have to meet in the middle and, and bring bring some of the laws down. So, but the, the biggest argument they said is it, it, you're not allowing women to choose, you know, to choose what they can do, whatever they want with their own body. The current law doesn't allow them to choose and do whatever they want with the body. There are already limits, or we're looking and limits and rules against when and how you can have abortion. We just want to bring those down a level so that you know it protects the unborn um, as well. Indeed. Well, well, as as you know from a recent conversation, uh, James, <clears throat> um, it was only when I when I, I decided to relaunch my own political party as a pro-family party, hopefully with the name Family Matters. We, we'll we should get clearance on that quite soon. That, that I investigated uh, the Scottish Family Party. And I've got to say, I was absolutely riveted by this stuff. Um, fantastic. Uh, along with my advisors, there were a number of areas that were pretty great to us, um, which you guys had totally worked through, um, including, including the pro-life. I mean, I have some advisors who, who feel that we shouldn't have it in our manifesto. Yeah. Um, but but, but they, they, they've changed their mind on, on the issue. Because I mean, it's something that I talk about quite a, quite a bit in my own conference speech, which is going to precede this. Um, and I end I end by comparing uh, World War II, which is the the most uh, lethal war in history, seventy million 
people dying over what was it six years yeah last year according to the world health organization 73 million abortions were carried out this is what happens when when women have that choice carnage on a scale we we, you know i do not believe we can call this a civilized society a civilized society does not kill its unborn it's used as a form of contraception it it totally by many when when in fact we have adequate contraception if you want to use it and you know and and that there are there are people and families crying out to adopt so you know that there are Indeed. alternatives and, and and we as a party would want to push those kind of things as well and we're quite often mis- misunderstood on certain things because people read a headline so we're when it comes to gender politics you know we do believe you know a child should be brought up with a, a mother and a father ideally but that doesn't mean we don't recognize or or would support a family that isn't of that of that that makeup no, um no. We, we also don't support the fact that you can change for very easily from a man to a woman um there's a lot of um push for the the government to to make it very very simple for someone to just declare themselves a, you know under a, a different sex different gender and um it's actually not that easy and, and well, it shouldn't I, be yes. taken easy yeah there's that. a distinction it's interesting we, we have two professors speaking about transgenderism at this conference um eric anderson and um and jared casey and jared casey makes the point that um I mean, gender, you know, I think Facebook recognized 50 genders, don't they, today? Um, I think, I think you, you can call yourself a teapot, and that's one of them. Um, but, but, I mean, gender is one thing, possibly, but sex is another. And yeah. he's, he, he wrote a book called, I can't immediately see it, but, but he, 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 he wrote a very good book on it, and his talk is very good, too. Um, yes, I mean, the idea that you can, the fact that you, well that's that this is a tangent with that would take us another hour yeah so, no, so, 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 yeah. so perhaps we, we 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 shouldn't go there but uh james has been an, it's been a fascinating insight into into you know men a man and how he suffered from domestic uh violence and, and abuse and i'm very pleased you got through it yeah um and, there was times um, when i might not have got through it because you know no, indeed. suicidal thoughts self-harming at times yeah. really d- dark moments but I, i'm i'm way beyond that now and i just i just like to help other well, it's, people. It's, yeah. well, it's a major driver of male suicide, um, as, yes. as, as you probably know, which is already very high. Um, and uh, many men in the situation you were in end up among the street homeless. And that, that, mm. that reduces life expectancy by an average of 30 years. When, when you join up the dots uh, from women's unaccountability uh, before the law and the lack of support for men, it's a, it's a terrifying picture we have. But unfortunately, this, this interview has to come to an end, James. Thank you so much for your time and your insights. Yep. And it's a wrap. Good. We can continue in the Q&A next. <laughs> Indeed. Look, look forward to that. I'm sure it's going to be a good one. Thank you.